All right, now we're to this awesome subject. How in the world do I know if a reaction is going to be E1, E2, SN1, or SN2? <laughs> I'm totally going to answer that. However, in order to make sure that I don't get absolutely vilified by all of my colleagues who are specialists in the world of organic chemistry, I have to give you guys this disclaimer. The sad fact is that in reality, many reactions will do both elimination and substitution competitively. For example, if I've got a simple material like this, leaving group stuck to a secondary carbon, it could potentially do E1, E2, SN1, or SN2, depending on what I react it with. If, for instance, I react it with a very strong base, methoxide, that has a localized negative charge on this oxygen, that methoxide might potentially come in here, form a bond with this carbon, and kick off the bromide, giving me this product. This would be an SN2 reaction. Now, as we discussed in our previous chapter's coverage of SN2s, because this methoxide has to come in from the back side of this bromine, you get inverted stereochemistry. Thus, if this carbon-bromine bond were wedged in the starting material, the carbon-oxygen bond would be dashed in the product. Now, in contrast, you could take the exact same molecule, and you could imagine taking the exact same base, methoxide, and rather than having it form a bond with the carbon that's stuck to the leaving group, it could potentially grab the hydrogen on the carbon next door, pump these electrons down to close, giving you a double bond, and kick off the bromide. This would give us potentially two different products, the trans, or E product, and the cis, or Z product. The trans, of course, would be the more favorable in this scenario. This would be an E2 reaction. I'm throwing this out at you guys so that you can recognize that, on paper at least, and often in reality, you're going to get both E2s and SN2s occurring in some circumstances. Now, similar things might occur under SN1E1 conditions. For example, I can take this same molecule we were looking at before, leaving groups stuck to a secondary carbon, and start in the presence of a weak base, methanol, which has no negative charge on the oxygen. It just has lone pairs and a partial negative on the oxygen. As that's stirred in solution, the bromine takes off, giving me a secondary carbocation. And then you could imagine this methanol coming into that hole and the oxygen forming a bond with that carbon. This would be SN1 style. Of course, this oxygen is going to bring this hydrogen along with it, being temporarily positively charged until a second molecule of methanol can come and extract that hydrogen, pump the electrons into that oxygen to give me my final product. As we discussed in our previous chapter's coverage of substitution, this reaction scenario is going to give us both enantiomers rather than a complete inversion of stereochemistry as we would see in an SN2 scenario. Now I want you to contrast that with this. I could potentially react the exact same molecule with the exact same base, methanol. And imagine that stirring around until the bromine leaves, giving me a secondary carbocation. And I could imagine the methanol, instead of coming down and forming a bond with that positively charged carbon, grabbing the hydrogen next door and pumping these electrons down like a door and a hinge to close, giving me these alkene products. The transalkene will, of course, be more favorable in this scenario because it's more stable. This is an E1 reaction. So on paper, this weak base, methanol, could potentially do both of these two reactions, and in reality, probably does. So as a typical organic chemistry student at an undergraduate level, you might be wondering, well, what in the world am I supposed to do, Mike? How in the world can I pick which of all of these different scenarios is going to play out? Well, don't worry. I'm going to give you the answer. I want to qualify my answer by once again emphasizing the fact that the answer I'm going to give you will give you a clean cut, nice system for being able to determine which of these reactions it's going to be. However, I want you to understand that in reality, both elimination and substitution can sometimes occur competitively depending on the scenario. So that brings us to this. Mike's list of three questions. To determine if an elimination or substitution reaction is going to be E1, E2, SN1, or SN2. Question number one. Is the carbon bonded to my leaving group 
primary, secondary, or tertiary. If it's primary, then the reaction can only be SN2 or E2. Why? The reason is because you'll remember that in E1 and SN1 reactions, the leaving group takes off first, giving me a carbocation. Will that ever occur with a primary carbon? Am I ever going to get a primary carbocation? No, they're way too unstable. So once again, if it's primary, it can only possibly be SN2 or E2. Now if it's tertiary, it can't be an SN2. Now don't worry, I'll explain later on why. Thus, if it's tertiary, it can only be SN1, E1, or E2. Now if it's secondary, or if it's a stabilized carbon, such as one in an allyl or a benzyl position, then it could be any of the above. All of this is summarized in this little figure I made myself. Leaving group stuck to primary carbon, SN2 or E2, done. If it's stuck to tertiary, it can only be SN1, E1, or E2. And if it's any of these, then it could be any of the above. Now if you're in any of these ambiguous circumstances, you might wonder, what in the world am I supposed to do? The answer is, go to the next question. Number two, is my nucleophile slash base strong or weak? Now remember from our previous discussions, strong nucleophiles slash bases have negative charges. Now there are some exceptions to this. Negative charges that are on halogens or negative charges that are resonance stabilized are weak. If your nucleophile slash base is strong, then your reaction will be a 2, either SN2 or E2. If it's weak, then it will be a 1, either SN1 or E1. Remember, localized negative charge not on a halogen, strong. Negative charge on halogens or resonance to localized negative charge or no negative charge at all will be weak. Here are some examples of some strong nucleophile slash bases. Keep in mind that the letter M here represents a group 1 metal from the periodic table, either lithium, sodium, or potassium. Anytime you see one of those, you can essentially erase it and replace it with a negative charge. I got one of those attached to a carbon, attached to an oxygen that can't resonance to localize, attached to a sulfur, a nitrogen, or another carbon that can't resonance to localize. These are all strong, reactive, and powerful nucleophiles or bases. Here are some examples of some weak nucleophiles slash bases. I've got a resonance to localized negative charge, such as a carbonate, or I've got an alcohol, or water, or a thiol, or an amine. Examples where all I've got are lone pair electrons to act as bases. I don't have a localized negative charge at all. I only have a partial negative charge due to polarity. Or if I've got negatively charged halides, like iodide, bromide, or chloride. These are all weak nucleophile slash bases that will participate in SN1, E1 reactions. Now, I realize in asking this question, question number two, we still aren't completely done. There still is some ambiguity, so you might wonder, what do I do next? Well, if you're in a scenario where you still haven't figured out what it is by the time you're done with question two, you go on to question number three, which says, is my nucleophile slash base a nucleophile or a base? Now, notice in questions one or two, I haven't had to make the distinction yet as to which of these two it is. We don't do that until we get to question number three. Let me explain. In substitution and elimination reactions, a nucleophile is something that does substitution, while a base is something that does elimination. The letter S in SN1 and SN2 stands for substitution, and the letters N stand for nucleophilic. Thus, a nucleophile in a substitution elimination scenario is something that will prefer to do substitution, while a base will prefer to do elimination. So how in the world do we make the distinction between a nucleophile or a base? The answer is size. Larger nucleophile slash bases tend to behave more as bases, that is they tend to favor elimination, because they can't fit as easily into the carbon bonded to the leaving group to do a substitution. They therefore prefer to tear hydrogen off from next door to do an elimination. Now in contrast, smaller nucleophile slash bases tend to behave more as nucleophiles favoring substitution because they can fit more easily into the carbon bonded to the leaving group to do a substitution. Now let me show you that right here. Once again, in an SN2 scenario, I've got my molecule, in this case a secondary carbon stuck to bromine, and my strong nucleophile comes in to that position and kicks off my bromide in one fell swoop. 
ba bam giving me my product which has an inverted stereochemistry relative to the stereochemistry at this stereo center in the starting material now note I've got my strong nucleophile slash base in order to do a substitution SN2 it has to come into this carbon and kick off the bromide in order to fit into this carbon hole it's much easier to do that if you're small that's why I'm telling you small nucleophile slash bases tend to favor substitution more than large bulky nucleophile slash bases now I have to point out something here this is the reason why SN2's cannot occur on tertiary carbons if I've got a carbon here that is stuck to three carbons so it's tertiary it's impossible for a nucleophile to get into that whole SN2 style no matter how small that nucleophile is even if I've got a tiny nucleophile if it's trying to attack a tertiary carbon it will not do a substitution it will just do an E2 elimination let's compare that to our E2 scenario in an E2 I've got my strong nucleophile slash base that rather than coming into the carbon bond of the leaving group grabs a hydrogen off the carbon next door pumps the electrons down and kicks off the bromide in one fell swoop to give us our two alkene products with the trans product being favored now I gotta tell you if my base is big it's much more difficult for it to come in fit into this hole and do a substitution hence it will favor just grabbing a hydrogen off of next door and doing an elimination what's the point smaller base slash nucleophiles tend to be more nucleophiles and tend to favor substitution whereas larger base slash nucleophiles tend to be larger and favor elimination same thing applies for SN1 versus E1 scenarios in an SN1 my starting material floats around until the leaving group takes off giving my carbocation intermediate if I've got a nucleophile slash base that of course does not have a strong localized negative charge if that nucleophile slash base is small it's going to be much easier for it to fit into that hole thereby doing substitution now in contrast in an E1 scenario I've got the same molecule leaving group takes off gives me my carbocation intermediate imagine my weak base slash nucleophile is large in size it's a lot harder to fit into a positively charged carbocation hole if you're a big bulky base thus larger bases will favor elimination grabbing the hydrogen next door pumping the electrons down to give me my two products with the trans one being favored of course so yes base slash nucleophile size does matter smaller nucleophile slash bases will favor substitution while larger ones will favor elimination all because of the difficulty of getting in to a small carbocation hole so you might ask then where do I draw the line regarding size for my class and the students who take my class any nucleophile slash base that looks larger than ethanol whose structure is shown here when you draw it on paper is a base and will do an E reaction anything that's equal to or smaller than ethanol on paper is a nucleophile and will do an S or substitution reaction that is where I draw the line for my students I want you to remember of course that for many of these nucleophile slash bases in reality you can get some substitution and some elimination occurring competitively I have of course some exceptions although acetate which has this structure right here might look larger than ethanol on paper it is a nucleophile and will do S reactions also negatively charged carbon and sulfur atoms are almost always going to act as nucleophiles regardless of size so these are the nuances I want you to remember back to our lineup nucleophiles that are smaller than ethanol on paper are things like this they will favor substitution reactions either SN2 or SN1 depending on whether or not they're strong or weak bases in contrast are molecules that look on paper larger than ethanol they will favor eliminations